Hey, thanks for being here this evening. Um, I'm Kevin Conover. We're broadcasting down here in Southern California. If you're listening uh, locally, we are on K Praise 1210 AM. And uh, we're talking about uh, marriage. Uh, you may or may not know this. This is pretty crazy. I just learned this. Um, Malaysia actually banned the celebration of Valentine's Day in 2005, stating it has elements of Christianity. Pakistan's high court in Islamabad also banned any celebrations, media coverage, or mention of Valentine's Day in 2017. So that's pretty pretty funny um, to me. I never uh, heard before that Valentine's Day had been <laughs> banned. And uh, Jason is on the air with me uh, this evening. He's um, my producer or helps me put all this together. So uh, Jason, uh, say hi to everybody, man. Hey, Kevin, thank you so much for allowing me to join the show tonight. Look forward to speaking about why matter, marriage matters. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, I figured it's great because you have hair and, and you add a different, you know, <laughs> dynamic to the show. So, <laughs> well, thanks for letting me come be from behind the curtain and to the yeah, stage here. Yeah. Appreciate so, you it. know, depending on how it goes, um, you know, we might see more of Jason or maybe not, you know, if it doesn't go that well. <laughs> anyway, um, what, I, what I really wanted to talk about was, uh, you know, some brief history of Valentine's Day. Uh, I got this from the Family Research Council's website. This is pretty crazy. Most people don't know this. Um, February 14th actually marks the anniversary of St. Valentine of Rome's martyrdom. That is his death, right? In AD 269. He was executed by the emperor for his Christian faith and for marrying couples when marriage was temporarily illegal. Can you believe that? Can you can you imagine if you lived in a time when marriage was illegal? Um, that crazy. That, that's intense. I mean, would you still get married if you were risking getting uh, put in prison, right? Um, like so, Braveheart. <laughs> yeah, Braveheart. Except, for, uh, hey, that, that was good. That's like a play on words, Braveheart, right? <laughs> Hey, did you just come up with that on your own? Yeah, <laughs> hey, that was good. Right, uh, so, <laughs> so listen to this. St. Valentine's life and death uh, demonstrate the high price that can sometimes accompany standing up for Christian values. St. Valentine lived in Rome during the reign of Claudius II. He was also known as Claudius the Cruel. The Roman government was notorious for persecuting Christians ever since the church's founding because Christian ethics dissented from the practices of polygamy, homosexuality, pedophilia, and prostitution that were prevalent in the empire. Boy, that is so interesting to me that the contrast between Christian ethics and what people were practicing at the time, I mean, we're seeing a lot of this kind of stuff become more and more uh, popular in our culture today. And so it's, it's uh, crazy how uh, history often repeats itself. It says here, uh, Rome was at war while Claudius II was in power, and he believed unmarried men made the best soldiers because they did not have families at home to worry about and could not use their marriage as an excuse to get out of military service. His desire to strengthen his army, combined with his prejudice towards Christians, led to his decision to make marriage illegal in Rome for a time. But Valentine continued to marry people in secret, and this uh, ended up with his martyrdom. He ended up being arrested and actually killed for marrying people in secret. <laughs> Pretty outrageous. Wow. When you think of um, reasons why you would die for Christ, it's not usually because you're thinking like, well, I'm going to go conduct some weddings here and maybe I'll get put in jail for that, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, um, that's unbelievable. <laughs> it is. It's pretty wild. And yet um, it makes a lot of sense, um, you know, in light of what we're seeing. This is something else that's really interesting. If you if you kept up with what's happened over the past year, uh, this came out in the news not too long ago, where BLM um, on the website, on their website, uh, they were actually, uh, they, they claimed to be trained Marxists. This was uh, the co-founder, Patrice Cullers described herself and her fellow co-founder, uh, Alicia Garza, as trained Marxists. And in on their website, it actually said um, that they wanted to di dismantle the nuclear family structure. And um, they came under fire for that. That's been removed from their website since a um, uh, particular NFL lineman, um, Mark Marcellus, Marcellus Wiley, actually blasted them over that and uh, got it all out there and said, hey, what are you doing? Family is really important to me. And uh, they ended up taking it down. But, you know, I looked into this because I was thinking to myself, this, what a wild, uh, wh why would anybody ever say that? 
But it does turn out that a uh, central tenet of Marxism, Marxism is the dismantling of the nuclear family structure. And of course, we don't mean uh, nuclear, nuclear weapons there. Uh, you know, um, it actually means nuclear as in this is the basically the, the kernel or the most important thing is what we're looking at here. So thanks for explaining that. I was yeah. wondering what you're talking about, <laughs> nuclear family. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Uh, I think pe people are like, well, I, I can't support the nuclear family. That's, you know, <laughs> a, nuclear weapons or whatever. No, no, that's not what it has to do with. <laughs> It, it meant something far before we were dealing with nuclear energy or anything like that. It's not, uh, not, good. yeah, not, <laughs> not nuclear weapons. <laughs> so, um, so if you hear that, hear, hear that uh, us refer to that, you know, that's not, that's not a bad thing. Nuclear family here. Well, so when we, we say nuclear family, we're essentially saying the biological mother and father and the biological kids all connected. That's the nuclear family. Mm. Um, but interestingly enough, Marxism actually teaches the dismantling of the nuclear family. That's a weird thing. Why would anybody want to dismantle the nuclear family? I mean, what, even a Marxist, what, what would be the point of that, of, of taking that down? Yeah. You got to go back to the root. Um, you know, it's really an attack on God. That's what I believe. And uh, I'm sure you're going to get there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Um, check this out. This is crazy. Marxists argue that the nuclear family performs ideological functions for capitalism. The family acts as a unit of consumption and teaches passive acceptance of hierarchy. It is also the institution through which the wealthy pass down their private property to their children, thus reproducing class inequality. Have you ever heard that before, Jason? I've never heard of that, but it does sound very wicked. <laughs> that is wild, is that? I mean, that just- it is. Uh, is uh, uh, I mean Marxism, you know, uh, is is obviously opposed to capitalism, uh, which is interesting because the Bible is actually pro-capitalism in the sense that um, a person gets to keep what they earned. If you work hard, you get to keep it. Nobody right. gets to take what you've earned um, in the Bible. That's considered theft, and um, and so obviously the Bible is opposed to communism, which is the government. Uh, you know, ultimately socialism leads to communism is uh, the disbursement of material goods, regardless of who worked for them or earned them and who didn't. And uh, I find that uh, really interesting that Marxism actually, for that reason, wants the nuclear family to go away because they believe it's teaching hierarchy. And in, in communism, there's not supposed to be hierarchy. Now, of course there is. If we look at all the communist governments around the world, there's incredible hierarchy. Um, and there's, there's tyranny, uh, yet they're advocating for no hierarchy, which is just a mythical ideal that doesn't exist in the real world. So right. crazy stuff. Um, and, and, you know, we're not going to get sidetracked too far on capitalism and, and, uh, Marxism other than to say that, that Marxism wants to get rid of the nuclear family structure. And, and for that, for that particular reason that I said, but um, so Valentine here is promoting marriage. And what we know now from the social science is that marriage is one of the most beneficial things, if not the most beneficial thing you can have in a society. Um, the promotion of the Christian ethic of marriage, one man, one woman, um, in that relationship forever, raising their kids and, uh, not forever, sorry, till death do us part. Right. That's right. So <laughs> that's, it's well, a funny thing because- heaven. Yeah, you're not married in heaven. A lot of people right. think we're going to be together forever, you know, yeah. but, uh, you know, how does your wife feel about that, Jason, that you guys are, you're going to. She's disappointed. And if she <laughs> goes before me, she said, I can't marry anybody else. So yeah, does gonna... she tell you that? <laughs> yeah. 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 I know. That's what my wife honor said. Her, what, I'm going to honor what she, her wishes. So <laughs> you're not going to get married in heaven. Nope. No, I'm not yeah. going to get married if she passes. Oh, okay. So, okay. Yeah. I got you. I got yeah. you. <laughs> so, so married 18 years and it's it's been amazing so uh you obviously. guys everything's gone probably perfectly for you like your marriage is just there's just never been any fights or anything right no um uh, <laughs> no i'd be lying <laughs> if i said that was the truth but uh yeah we're both sinners and we both um there's a lot of challenges in the first few years of our marriage that, that was very uh, went through a lot of ups and downs but um 
you know, as, as uh, we remain faithful to God, number one, um, he's helped us through so many different challenges in our life. We've been together for 18 years. I'll just tell you a quick story. She went off um, on a, a, a trip a couple of weeks ago. We've barely ever been apart. And it was hard for me to kind of let her go off and, and be independent for a little bit because I, <laughs> I had to watch the kids when I was at home. But it was it was challenging, you know, being eight, married 18 years and she's gone and I'm here with the kids. And it's, um, you know, you're learning something new every day. And that's what, you know, it's, it's all about marriage is you never give up. You, ne- you never quit. You keep moving on and, and through any challenge that God um, that's presented, he'll help you through it. Yeah. 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 I mean, um, there is marriage is incredibly challenging. I think, um, I've been married for 22 years now, so I beat you on that, uh, Jason. Um, <laughs> Good job. that's pr- probably why I have less hair too. Though. Yeah. <laughs> Mine's but, great, though. yeah, that's true. You're getting there. You still got a lot of color though. Yeah. <laughs> Do you dye your hair? No, that's, that's natural. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, I mean, I think marriage is incredibly challenging and, uh, but all the, all the social science and the Bible, of course, um, actually shows that it's worth the challenge. Um, right. Time magazine did a big series on happiness and the, what older couples described if they had been married, um, in a long-term marriage, they described the longevity of the marriage as the most surreal and special part Mm. of their lives that led to the most happiness. Um, and I thought this was really interesting. Time magazine, um, the counselors described marriage as uh, they called it a commitment device. And it was something where you were committing to being married and it locked you into something that, that um, put off immediate gratification at times, but lo- led to long-term gratification. Hmm. And uh, I thought that was really interesting because in our lives, a lot of times we need this. We commit to different things. We, we might commit to a, a savings plan. We might commit to an exercise plan. We might, and, and we, we put ourselves under this, um, this requirement. Um, and, and in the short term, whether it's with a coach or something, right. Or, or a right. physical trainer and partway through it, you're like, I want out, I want to get out of this. Right. <laughs> but, but you've committed to it and the coach right. holds you to that. And, in the long run, you know, it's good for you. And, and a lot of times there's things like that in marriage where you think to yourself, Oh man, I don't know if I'm going to make it. And, um, yet that commitment, and especially if you have that community around you, that church community, I think that's, you know, part of the reason that Christ founded the church was that community helps you to keep that commitment and, um, to follow through. And all, and ultimately it's a benefit to you. It's a benefit to your spouse. It's a benefit to your kids and it's a benefit to your community. Um, you know, what it does for you. So, yeah, if I didn't have the faith that having God, it'd be difficult. Um, you know, I'd lose a lot of hope. I'd lose, um, probably want to, I mean, sometimes you want to run off as it is, but if you can fall back on God's word and what he says about marriage and he hates, he hates, not he hates divorce. <laughs> he doesn't hate marriage. He hates divorce. And that's one thing, you know, um, I look at is if, God doesn't, doesn't say God hates many things, but he hates divorce. Mm. And um, so that's, that's one of the, the biggest reasons that we uh, strive not to go to bed angry. Um, we, we pray together, we communicate often, and we, we trust one another. And that's, those are things that we do. And we've learned to, to grow into those things. We, they weren't things that we established overnight, but after 18 years, it gets better and better. So yeah. And, struggling. and, um, you know, it's interesting because, um, all the social science confirms what the Bible teaches. And, and, and you know, it says that in Micah, it says God hates divorce. And then it says, um, why does he hate divorce? Because he desires godly offspring. And, uh, yeah. the impact that, um, a healthy marriage has on kids is, is astonishing. Honestly. Um, when I first started looking into this, uh, I was blown away by the the facts that have come out based on uh, long term marriages. Let me read some of these to you. It's pretty pretty incredible. Um, it says here, a five year study released in 1998 found that continuously married husbands and wives experience better emotional health and less depression than people of any other marital status. A 1990 review of research found that husbands and wives also have better physical health, 
while the unmarried have significantly higher annual death rates, about 50% higher for women. And check this out, Jason, how much higher do you think the death rate goes up for an unmarried man? It's 50% uh, higher for unmarried women. How much higher do you think it is for men? 60. 60. <laughs> Dude, it's 250%. 200? What? <laughs> yeah. That's I was like, I was like, what? <laughs> but it makes sense. You know, if you think well, if you leave guys to themselves, put a whole bunch of guys right. in a room together and what happens, right? <laughs> yeah. You start fighting and <laughs> I teach, I teach high school students, right? If you put yeah. a whole bunch of high school boys in a, in a locker room together and there's yeah. no adult supervision, oh, man, I mean, you're, you're talking about <laughs> disaster just like really yeah. quick. Somebody's yeah. going to get stuffed in a locker. You know, somebody's going <laughs> to, it's just going to, it's just going to get out of control. But so God actually designed uh, marriage to be a benefit to uh, men and women. But let me read a, a few more of these because it goes on here. Um, married people are less likely to be the victims of any type of violent crime than are those who have divorced, separated, or never married. Hmm. Families headed by married couples also have much higher incomes and greater financial assets. I, th I think that one about violent crime is really interesting too, um, but it makes sense. Uh, the Bible teaches this. It says that... Um, uh, two are better than one. When one falls down, uh, he has no one to help him up. But when, when, when one falls down and, and there's two, then they have somebody else to, to pull them up. And right. boy, that is so true. I mean, there's been so many times where my wife um, encourages me to do the right thing and helps me to see something from a perspective I may not have seen before. Um, and just really helps me to um, uh, think through something that, um, I may have rushed into. And so, um, I'm sure you can, you can, um, sure share that same uh, fact. So, yeah, I mean, it, she, my wife is one of my big, you know, she's my biggest cheerleader. I mean, she's really there to encourage edify and really get me through things. It's tough when she's away. And when I'm, you know, watching the kids or doing, doing anything, she's, <laughs> she's just my, one of my biggest supporters. So it's, it's definitely uh, true rings true. Um, to have that support and in your life, it's, I think I look pretty young for my age and, and, uh, um, it's because of my wife, really. She's, <laughs> she's blessed me. <laughs> He's actually, he, Jason's actually 83, but uh, <laughs> he does look really young. No. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Here's a huge, for, for those of you who like facts, here's, here's some more, because it's not just the couples that are, um, blessed who stay married. It's also their kids. Listen to this. This is crazy. 70% of long-term prison inmates grew up without fathers. Seven out of wow. every 10 long-term prison inmates grew up without fathers. Man. Even as far back as 1987, a study found that divorce, regardless of the economic status of the disrupted family, was the strongest correlation with robbery rates. So there was, mm. this, is, this is unreal. There was nothing that, that uh, correlated more closely with divorce than robbery rates. That's wow. Incredible. Divorce goes up, robbery goes up. I didn't find divorce that statistic. Down, robbery goes down. <laughs> yeah. I guess they just ask them when they, uh, after they robbed a the store, hey, did you have a father? They well, I, no, I don't think that. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> uh, no, I think all they did was they looked at, um, because, you know, uh, divorces are filed in a court. So you can, you can see how many divorces are taking place in a particular town or a particular city. It's sure. not hard. They, they keep track of all the divorces. And yeah. so all they have to do is go to the police and go, how are the robbery rates? Because those are all tracked too. Then, right. they, then they go to the uh, courts and say, what are the divorce rates? And they look that's at amazing. that and there it is. Lo and behold, that's the strongest correlating factor um, mm. in the city. Uh, among all possible contributing factors, only divorce rates are consistently associated with suicide and with homicide rates. And that's really sad. Um, yeah. but from a practical standpoint, you know, I used to be a youth pastor and I saw, um, the impact of kids who didn't have a father in the home and they're coming home. There's nobody there and, uh, they're left to themselves, left to fend for themselves. Right. Um, and it, it was just a sad reality that that was the case. Um, very, very difficult. And so this is from time. This is what I ta was talking about earlier. Couples who have made it all the way later into life together have found it to be a peak experience, a sublime experience to be together. 
says Carl Pillemer, a Cornell University professor and gerontologist who did an intensive survey of 700 elderly people for his 2015 book, 30 Lessons for Loving. Everybody, 100%, said at one point that the long marriage was the best thing in their lives. Right. Here's one one of the others uh, from the Time Magazine article on happiness. One of the strongest effects marriage has is on people's health. The beneficial effects have held up in study after study. Married people are less likely to have strokes, less likely to have heart disease, and Mm. less likely to have depression. They respond better to stress. If they get sick, they're less likely to die of a fistful of diseases, including cancer, and they recover more quickly when they do. Uh I always tell, uh, you know, one of the things I was reading on this uh, issue before, and um, uh, they said that when you go to counseling, one of the most powerful impacts a counselor has, regardless of the type of counseling he uses, um, is just the fact that you get to, to share with somebody what's on your heart. You know, they say, I just needed to get that off my chest and just being able to have somebody listen. And in a lot of ways in marriage, you have somebody who's there all the time who you can share with, you know, unless you just got in a fight and and then they don't want to hear, hear you talk. But, (laughs) but in general, you have somebody on a regular basis, you know, week after week, month after month, year after year, who you can share your burdens with. And um, even if they're not physically carrying those burdens emotionally, it's just somebody to talk to. And, and um, you know, for those people who aren't married, God's provided us with the church and that's what the church is meant for. It it, it talks about this all the time, the fellowship we have in in Christ. Um, But also, of course, um, in Genesis chapter two, it says it's not good for the man to be alone. And God here is speaking very specifically of the fact that um, we, we need to be able to talk to somebody and share what's going on in our hearts and our, our minds. Sure. I, I think God made us to be social creatures. You know, um, I think it just moving out, I moved out to Kentucky three years ago. Everything I knew was in San Diego and building community. I, it's hard to build community when you're first, you know, when you're coming to a new land and um, I'm grateful to have my wife. I mean, my best friend, I mean, it really, we have each other to, to, to talk to you and, and, uh, confide in and share with share different things, different struggles, but yeah, without her, it would be very challenging to move to a new area, not have those connections and, and the support that I had, you know, from, from back home, but it's, it's really a, a true blessing to be, to have her in my life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, what's interesting here too, is, you know, our, our culture has been changing and they, you know, there's, there's been a lot of um, pushback against um, what people would call traditional marriage. Um, we, we hear it in uh, people who are saying, you know, I'm opposed to the patriarchy or hmm. whatever it is, and people moving towards socialism or saying we need to embrace different types of families. Um, this, is, uh, <clears throat> this is a lady, Cassandra Cotton. She said this, She's an assistant professor at uh, the Sanford School of Social and Family Dynamic. And here she's, he's, she's um, talking against the nuclear family. Um, mm-hmm. She says, a broader acceptance and understanding of what family can look like to different people helps us move beyond a very restrictive view to a recognition that family is what you make it. There isn't just one family to picture when we think about families. The unions, the unions that we're forming now, whether they're same sex or opposite sex, interracial, interreligious, and so on, will have an impact on what our population looks like in the future. The children raised in these families will go on to have their own families later in life, whatever those might look like, whatever family looks like for you, it's something to celebrate. And I think, I think you know, um, not everybody's born into an optimal situation and nobody would ever say, Oh, it's not a family. That, that's ridiculous. Um, people need to be loved wherever they're at and whoever they are and in whatever circumstance they're in, we need to do the best we can to love people. But there's no doubt about it that God designed things to be a particular way. And, um, we do ourselves a favor when we look at the way God has designed things and then do our best to live by those standards, because those standards produce the results that are the healthiest, the happiest, and uh, the best for everybody involved. And, and so I think it's a, a real disservice to, to try to equate these, uh, these other things as opposed to what God designed for people to be. 
Um, and he only wants the best for people, right? He's not trying to discourage people. He's not trying to um, make people feel less than simply because their situation is not ideal. But it doesn't mean that we we stop looking for doing our best to to move in that direction. I agree. I think it sounds like a big uh, social science project. It's it's really it's kind of sad. There's really no foundation there for where they're even. Um, I mean, there's no. It, it's kind of just like creating whatever you want it to be. I mean, it's it's a, it's really there's no. Um, what am I trying to say? There, there's just not a lot. There's no of, standard. Yeah, there's no standard. There's. It's, it's just arbitrary. Uh, yeah. You know, I had, um, I was talking to some students and, and we were having this discussion about the fact that there's polygamy in the Bible. Hmm. And, you know, the, the, the question comes up, well, look at, look at, there's polygamy in the Bible. What's the big deal? Um, because people are having these throuples and, you know, whatever other kind of relationships and uh, polyamory and all these things. And the difficulty here is, is that um, it, I, I was talking about this, that that, uh, you know, and, and I actually heard a kid talking about this, this kid was discussing his family, um, who, which was from Utah and I'm not trying to disparage Mormons or anything, but he came from a fundamental Mormon family, not, not from the main church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but his father actually had 11 wives and 33 mm -hmm. kids. And the kid actually said he didn't like his family. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, when, when he was asked why he said, well, I can, I can count on one hand the amount of times I've had a decent conversation with my father. Hmm. And so what polygamy does is it actually disconnects the father from the children simply because of the fact that he can't possibly um, have a significant relationship with each of these children. He's producing so many kids. I mean, right. King Solomon's the best example <laughs> of not, not being connected to your family. I mean, he had 700 wives and uh, I can't imagine he knew all their names. He was like, well, you are wife number what, 342? Uh, it's just crazy, right? And yeah. so God's design is meant to, to produce an, the best possible outcome for everybody involved. Hmm. And anything less than that is, is going to lead to a less beneficial outcome. And so, you know, it's sad to me that somebody is trying to say that, Hey, whatever you want to make family is whatever it, whatever it is. It's just, it's just not true. It's going to ultimately end up hurting more people. Not, um, not and how far does that go? I mean, Hey, I want to marry my pet. I want to marry, you know, it's, it just continues to go off in the direction where you, I mean, it, you can't pull that back in and it's just, um, yeah. And a lot of people don't realize there are consequences. There are consequences right. to, um, how we treat this issue and people think, no, 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 just let people do whatever they want to do. And, you know, God gives us all free will. The wonderful thing is there, but we also have the, we get the consequences of, of moving in the wrong direction. And, and so we all have to pray, Hey God, help me to keep on track. Help me to keep your perspective in mind. Help me to continue to follow your guidelines and, mm. and the way you've laid out for me to live. I'll share this. This is pretty unreal. Um, when the war on poverty began, there was only a single welfare program that assisted single parents, aid to families with dependent children, AFDC. Today, there are dozens of programs that do this, including the Women, Infants, and Children Food Program, WIC, Supplemental Security Income, SSI, food stamps, public housing, and Section 8 housing, and the Earned Income Tax Credit. These means-tested welfare programs provide extensive support to single parents, effectively encouraging the breakup of low-income marriages. A low-income single mother who marries an employed father will see her welfare benefits be substantially reduced. There are over 80 means-tested welfare programs that benefit low-income individuals. It is easier to fall in this threshold if a low-income woman remains unmarried or chooses to get out of her marriage. So people think, hey, government policy on these issues doesn't matter. Well, in fact, since the 1960s, we've seen a dramatic increase in the breakup of marriages. Today, only 22% of kids grow up with an, in a nuclear family, meaning mm -hmm. biological mother and father, biological kids. And we're seeing the results of this, right? We, right. we talked about the benefits of all that marriage does, and now we're seeing the consequences uh, borne out from that. And so mm -hmm. government policy can either encourage the success mm -hmm. of the nuclear family, right? And uh, continue to do that, or it can we can pass programs 
that actually fuel the disintegration of the nuclear family. And so we really need to get back on track and go, okay, not only, not only does the Bible teach it, but also social science is crystal clear. Um, this is the way God meant it for, for, to be and for people to thrive and, and do well. Um, so we're, we're running out of time here. Um, but, um, for those of you listening, I, I hope you have enjoyed this little discussion about Valentine's day. <clears throat> Jason, um, did you enjoy the discussion about Valentine's day? I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for letting me be a part of the show today. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, um, I'm just glad, uh, that marriage is still legal here in America and that <laughs> Amen. We're, we're not having to marry people in secret. <laughs> right. You conducted a wedding, didn't you? Yeah, I've, I've got to conduct two weddings. So uh-huh. I had to do the counseling and then the, the marriage ceremony with my sister and also a friend of mine, a good friend of yeah. mine. So that's great. Blessing you know, to was, be able to do that. It was funny. I was at the uh, gun shop the other day, a little while ago. And I'm, I'm in there. I'm, I'm, my son joined the shooting team for our, nice. our school. I think we have the, our school has the only shooting team in San Diego County, but awesome. uh, it's, it's trap shooting with uh, shotguns. And I, it was my first time um, going out and looking at all this stuff and, and uh, I'm in there. Right. And all, and the gun shop owner um, he's, he's talking to me and all of a sudden somebody comes in and, and obviously they know each other, like, like greeting each other with a big hug and everything. And, and the guy goes, Oh, it's so good to see you to, to the, the other guy. And, and he goes, he goes, um, you're all ready to do my wedding. Aren't you? <laughs> and and, and I, I was like, what? And the, the guy behind the counter that's selling the guns goes, yeah, I'll see you on Saturday. I, I can't wait to do your wedding. And that's I was awesome. like, what in the world? <laughs> so as soon as the guy left, I said, I said, you, you, um, uh, officiate weddings and he goes yeah yeah i love i love doing it it's a lot of fun huh. and, and so i was like man they're letting anybody marry marry people nowadays <laughs> this is this is crazy but uh it was just funny uh anyway um uh, for those of you listening i hope you had a great a great time listening to our uh little discussion here and um and i hope it's a benefit to you to understand a little bit more about the value of marriage and how significant it really is it's it's hugely significant and also maybe a little bit more appreciation for Valentine, St. Valentine and what he mm. did, the sacrifice he made. For me, it definitely makes me appreciate Valentine's Day more knowing that, whoa, this, this was actually named after a guy who literally thought enough of marriage that he was willing to ultimately uh, sacrifice his life for his belief in God and his belief in what God had set up. So that's pretty powerful. And uh, we'll be back again next week. And I hope you guys have a fantastic week and are able to enjoy um, your families and your, uh, your friends and your relationships that God has blessed you with. We'll see you next time. See you, Jason. Bye-bye. Thanks. Happy Valentine's. Okay. You too, man. Bye-bye.